President Kagame, thank you so much for joining us for a new edition of the Global Security Forum in Doha. Uh, thanks for agreeing to speak with me. I find it uh, kind of ironic because I think in all of my interviews with you, and there have been numerous, I've never worn a tie. And this morning I said, you know, I really ought to wear a tie. I mean, you didn't wear a tie, so I'm going to take my tie off. Uh, yes, yes, uh, please. You know, and just do that. But, but it's great yes, to relax. see you again. Yes, relax. <laughs> exactly. Hey, well, I, I want to start. You know, we're at, a, at a, a significant security conference, and security can mean many, many different things and different fronts. It can be global security, national security, regional security. It's also domestic security. And the worst kind of domestic security collapse is what Rwanda experienced uh, now over 30 years ago uh, in the ge genocide against the Tutsis. And you've just gone through, through the commemoration of 30 years of that. And I just want to start there. And I really regret not being in, in Kigali uh, for that. You invited me and I was unable to be there. But I wanted to ask um, how it, your nation feels after that horrible incident. What, as a, as a nation, have you learned? What are the strengths and what are your ongoing challenges 30 years after one of the world's worst genocides? Yeah. Right. Um... The way we feel today, the population and everybody is like uh, the tragedy is uh, behind us. It's left behind uh, many, three decades really. But it never gets that distant in the past uh, some traces of it uh, we live with. We have to live with maybe for more decades ahead. But what we chose to do in our case was not to be uh, held behind by uh, this tragedy, uh, the immense uh, burden everyone carries from that, because we're also thinking about uh, how do we live our future, mm. a future that is much better than uh, the past. So that's why there is that feeling that of creating a normal life and living a normal life and everyone get, going right. ahead as much as we can. So that is the feeling. One of the things that was in my mind when I visited Rwanda uh, the year before last is I went to one of the camps that, that does reconciliation work and basically really tries to reprogram uh, uh, folks that had been formerly in Rwanda, had been, been there, had escaped, had become part of forces that had been uh, um, attacking Rwanda, etc. But the, those that had been previously aligned with the uh, genocidal regime before you take these people back, and I saw and met many of them that had gone through this experience. So that's one vision I had. The other vision I know of is that recently there was a mass grave found in the Huye district of about a thousand people killed in 94 that weren't previously known in a grave. And I'm just, I just want to put on the table that that must be very, very hard for people to both be reconciling with those abroad in this. Also, you're You've had 30 year prison sentences and in many cases for those that many of those people are coming out of jail. How is that going inside of the, you know, the, the grit of society that still is discovering atrocities from the past? The society has been healing. And, and I think mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, uh, in my view, uh, something we didn't even expect that it would go this fast uh, mm. and and we've been working together we tried to bring the country back together uh, that has been the, the country has been divided uh, so badly people made to hate each other and that's the life that is the life and the politics they got used to Mm. Uh, but now it is the reverse of that, meaning we will try to build the unity uh, and it is happening. Uh, you can see it's something that is also benefiting and benefiting from 
the young generation, uh, the young people who constitute, uh, that is uh, 35 and below uh, years old, uh, are 73% of our mm. population. Right. So it, but of course, these uh, incidents keep reminding everyone that, uh, yes, there is that ugly past we, we've uh, gone through. Uh, we can't take anything for granted. We have to make sure that uh, this division to the extreme uh, that led to the genocide, uh, as we had it in 1994, uh, this should never happen again. We, we can't allow right. it. And, uh, so that is what primes everyone to look at what needs to be done uh, in terms of unity, in terms of uh, social economic progress uh, that will uh, really erase slowly. It is a slow right. process, but it will erase the but I, it may be slow, but I mean, in 30 years, it's remarkable. Your, your society, your nation almost disintegrated. And, you know, now I'm reading about Qatar Airways uh, investing in Rwanda Air, a new airport in Kigali coming in 2027. When I was at the gorilla naming ceremony before, I met one of the co-founders of BioNTech. I mean, you're bringing in uh, people, investment, and looking at future infrastructure in, in a country that almost disintegrated 30 years. So let me just transition here and ask you, you know, what is the Paul Kagame roadmap for the Rwanda development, given the fact that I've seen, you know, biotech uh, uh, top people in the world in the country. I've seen, uh, you know, the CEO of Qatar Airways talking to me about, about how important Rwanda could be as a hub uh, within Africa for Catavel. So I'd just like you to give us this kind of a around the corner look of your plan of the infrastructure you're bringing in for the country. And you know, infrastructure sometimes is not just planes and facilities, it's also people. How are you investing in people? Yeah, the foundation in this case for us is uh, unity. And we are building on that foundation by investing in people. When we invest in the human capital, when we mm. provide the goods for education and health and food security and bring in technology and therefore going to these other industries that uh, will make our economy, our country vibrant and grow and develop, like the service uh, industry, like. Mm hospitality and uh, industries like you've just mentioned, uh, biotech, uh, industries in the mining, because Rwanda has resources uh, and we need to change the uh, understanding, the mentality, because Rwanda, like many other African countries, with the enormous wealth, actually more countries in Africa have more wealth than Rwanda has, but we do have. Uh, just exporting raw materials and not processing, not adding value to anything, we have reversed that and everyone knows the benefits of doing that. So you've so, moved from being in the bottom of the value chain up that ladder? Absolutely, that is the main focus. Even when you, you, you just mentioned the Qatar Airways and having uh, invested together with the Qatar in a modern airport and other kinds of infrastructure, uh, digital infrastructure that we are promoting, all these are to add uh, value to any process, anything we have uh, in our economy, and therefore rising uh, in levels of uh, the value chain, as you said. So, Mr. President, let me ask you a question, and I may get this wrong, and, and I know it's a sensitive subject, but a lot of your neighbors have been suffering through a kind of um, post-colonial phases. We've seen a lot of instability, particularly in former 
uh, French uh, uh, controlled colony areas of, of coups and whatnot. And that's one part of the story. The other part of the story, and I have to admit the United States and China often talk about Africa as if it's a competitive zone for their interests. My experience with you and Rwanda is you're not allowing that story to be told there, that you're looking at different. So I'm interested in what is the secret sauce of how you're not allowing Rwanda to be recolonized by technology, by biotech firms, by foreign players, and, and that you reject this notion. I think that you're just a function of American and Chinese and Russian competition. Well, we have learned a lot of lessons and, and the world really has, and Africa should have learned uh, as many lessons as we have. But the question is, we need to show that we have learned lessons. We can't mm. repeat the same mistakes of the past and expect to be better going forward as we all want. So for us, from the tragedy and from also understanding the politics, the global politics and the relationships and so on and so forth, we have made a choice. And uh, to begin with, we work within the setting of the African continent. So when you talk about United States, China, maybe some other powers, you can say, put them together, Europe, and so on. I think lessons learned from Rwanda, here in Rwanda ourselves, but also similar to many other lessons that should have been learned across the continent. And we are seeing also US, China, uh, competition uh, turning into increasingly uh, adversarial sort of uh, relationship. We don't think it is correct for Africa or for Rwanda to just be consumed by these two powers and crushed in between. Mm. I think it is important for Africa for Rwanda to have this kind of uh, thinking that, no, we, we, we have something to do for ourselves. We, we have lives to live ourselves. We don't live for others and others don't live for us. And in fact, if you look at uh, Africa, currently about 20% of the global population in about 25 years, Africa will be constituting 25% of the global population. And that growth involving a middle class, probably the only middle class in the world that will be growing. Mm. I mean, how can we waste this asset? Right. And this is something terribly wrong with ourselves. We, 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 and we shouldn't accept this. So Rwanda working with other African countries on the continent, we think we can relate, be friends with others, United States, Europe, China, name it, uh, and not be dragged into this kind of conflict that benefits those others who are conflicting among themselves and simply impoverishing more or less uh, forever the African continent. So it's a hard task, it's a struggle, but nonetheless, it's the most noble thing we can do for ourselves. You know, I, I, we have limited time today because I'd like to spend a lot more time on this, but I would you know, tell you it would be a great op-ed for you to write on how you welcome Chinese investment, American investment, European investment in, but you set boundaries and you, you set laws. It'd be interesting to see what that template looks like yes. uh, because many of us that are you know, talking about this one don't know about how do you say, okay, China, we welcome you, but these are the lines you're not going to cross. Same thing to Americans, same thing to kind of reverse that issue about you know, your role, because I think, you know, to tell you the truth, the history um, of the African continent um, and, and interaction with a lot of other places in the world has been one of 
Africa being exploited. And so I think it's one of those interesting things in any turn around. But we, I, you have to put it in op-ed. But look, I want to get to another issue, um, basically, and that is how you look at security and security in the continent and where you've deployed, you know, deployed your own forces to help other nations that have requested troops. You've been very critical of UN uh, peacekeeping missions, uh, having inchoate strategy, inchoate instructions. But you've got forces in Mozambique, forces in the Central African Republic. I'm interested in not just why you're there, but what forces need when they're deployed somewhere else to try to secure stability that you think you might be achieving in your own deployment of, of, of Rwandan military forces versus some of your criticism of UN style deployments in which Rwanda forces have also participated. Yeah, it, it's, again, if you look at what has been happening, I mean, there is a lot of evidence. Uh, I, I, people don't even have to, but you can do the audit. Other people can do the audit. You mm. look at every part of the world where, let's say, the UN peacekeeping effort has been carried out or, or, and still in some places still happening. You can see how much has been invested, the presence of numbers of peacekeepers, the amount of money spent, the equipment and everything. And then look at what has come out of that. Mm. One typical example I can give you, if you look at uh, DRC, the Congo, our neighbor, we can talk about the problems that are between us and the whole region. And we will get there. The, the later on. So over 20 years, maybe 23 now, so much invested in tens of billions. And then if you look at, so what did they get from that? Zero. Hmm. Or actually even this, anyway, the problems continue as they were before. So why can't people just uh, take a moment and reflect on this. Is this the best way to actually deliver peace uh, that is needed in different places? Now, let's say with the Mozambique. First, the most important thing is if the people of any country want support and need support, and everybody sees that they need support. Mozambique requested Rwanda to work with them, support them in fighting the religious radical insurgency that was happening in the one province called the Cabo de Rigado, which is the three times the size of my country, geographically. Mm. So we went there because they requested, and we've been doing a good job with the uh, uh, our friends and partners in Mozambique. Mozambique also accepted others to come and help. That's a different issue. I, I, I will not talk about that. I'll talk about what concerns Rwanda. The place we deployed in, which is in that part of Cabo de Rigado, which was mainly affected, we resolved the problem over the last two and months, two years and some months, maybe 80% or 85% of that, working with the locals, working with the Mozambicans. Having really two tasks. One was to actually deliver security using our own, uh, even if you would say limited capacity, but it is mm -hmm. effective on the ground, and working together with the Mozambicans we're able to do that. And if you look at the cost of it, it's a very, you know, small cost if compared to what has been with other peacekeeping operations that have been going on mm -hmm. now. But even then, you can see that, as we were saying, lessons that are not learned even with, long, with time. Uh, the international community, which sometimes expresses support for Mozambique and this and that, 
do very little, in fact, to support this kind of thing, this model where Africans are getting together, working together to deliver the security that is required in different parts of the country. That is whether we are talking about Mozambique or Central African Republic. I mean, mm -hmm. you ask yourself, if what is needed, what people want is just the final product of delivering security, stability, so that, uh, and in fact, these countries are countries with huge resources and some of them have attracted investments from these developed countries. Instead of supporting that, they are not doing so. Well, they know if they even bring their model to work in there, bringing UN peacekeepers and so on and so forth. Well, they haven't done it, but even if they brought it, maybe it would be similar to what is happening in the DRC. Mm. So you wonder then, and this question keeps coming up anyway in everything, whether we learn lessons. And therefore, I don't think we do, because if we did, then we would be seeing uh, uh, what works actually working. But you find what mm. works is not even encouraged to work. It is even undermined. In right. fact, some questions being asked in Mozambique, you know, you see, but uh, Rwanda in Mozambique, but you know, they are also in Congo. And therefore that stops. They think by not helping uh, this operation in which uh, Rwanda is heavily involved, they are punishing Rwanda. I don't know for what. Right. But actually Mr. they are punishing Mozambique, <laughs> not mm. Rwanda. Because that's where the problem yeah. is. So I, I, under, I don't understand the logic. I don't understand the, uh, what. So people... let me ask you a question about about what you see as blind spots of the West when it thinks about security in Africa. So you know when I think about it, you know you, you mentioned the DRC, and recently I think about a week ago, uh, our State Department said to your government and to you you need to punish part of your own forces, which the United States assert cooperated with M23 and some attacks inside the DRC. And I don't want to get into a discussion of who did what to whom. Your government has denied that. I'm more interested in the question of what what is the, the, the Paul Kagame plan if, if you were to talk to Blinken and to Sullivan, which I know you have done. See, this is how, from your perspective, this needs to be fixed. But I'm interested in a more broad question as well. We've seen a lot of coups, Niger, Guinea, you know, various places you know, in, in the region. And you've just recently traveled to some of these countries just in the past week. What are we getting wrong in understanding stability in, in Africa that you think the United States and Europe can you know, significantly improve on? Well, to begin with, uh, what I would do if I would be talking to these uh, leaders in those countries, like United States and others, uh, I would uh, start by telling them that they can do much, much better than that. Mm. Because in the end, they are really doing nothing. Mm. Passing statements of condemnation and blaming this or that without addressing the problem, I think simply adds to the problem, not uh, it doesn't address it. So that's what I would start with telling them. And for every problem, there is a root cause. You simply look at the root cause of the problem and what the problem is, and work with the parties involved to address what needs to be addressed, in your mm -hmm. sense and reduce on the politics, on the interests, on this, on that. I mean, some of these things, they just don't go away unless you do what is necessary to be done that underlies the problem. I mean, it doesn't need a lot of uh, 
capacity to think or, or what? What all of mm. us have can serve us to, to, to understand the issues like this. So that's what I would tell you. Now, if you extend it across the continent, the main failure on our continent and these other places where the, there is a failure of governance and security, mm. both of them which are needed for any society to, to stabilize and function the way it should and the way the people would wish uh, to see happen. Mm. So if you look at where countries where coup d'etats have been happening, you know, nobody wishes to see coup d'etats happen in any place. There's nothing to celebrate about that. But at the same time, you don't, you don't stop that. You just don't condemn who's without even trying to find out, basically, what is it that led to this point? Mm. What was it that was lacking for a coup to happen? This is when you start seeing signs of that in governance or lack of security, as we have seen mainly in some of these countries in West Africa. I mean, these are things that anyone can see. You don't need to dig deep to investigate. You can see it. In fact, you can see it before it has happened. And you can tell that something is going to happen in this place or the other. So why can't people first on our own continent the Africans ourselves, in fact, which, again, we have talked about that. The way within Africa, Africans can work together to address a problem like we did in Mozambique or in Central African Republic. Mm. But with, with even uh, developed countries, uh, support or involvement the right way, it would happen faster and more easily. Why doesn't right. it happen? They all concentrate now on condemning. <laughs> By the way, it, it is funny. It is, in fact, ridiculous. Because in some cases, uh, they would condemn people in uh, certain places where coups have happened mm. and, and be quiet in, some other, in similar cases. <laughs> right. Same, it, it, like you see, even uh, the ferry of governance they attack, you know, countries, you know, lack of democracy, lack of freedom, lack of human rights, lack of this. And where some of these are lacking the most, but because of the interests that people have in, in those countries, it will be muted. Effectively, nothing to be talked about that. So, are we really addressing the problems the way they should be addressed? Or, or, or we are just posturing and talking about, you know, need for this and giving lectures and... Right. So let, and so. let, me try, let me try to squeeze in a couple of more quick questions before we go. One, one big one, I think, is, you know, in our past discussions, I remember talking to you when you visited Washington for the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit. And at that time, you know, you were beginning to think, you know, uh, uh, about the, the broader U.S.-Rwanda relationship. The, that relationship had some barriers in it, including Paul Recess Bagina being in prison. You, uh, your justice system commuted his sentence. A lot of progress has been made on the stumbling blocks in between Rwanda and the United States. But at the time when you were in Washington, you said, you know, Washington kind of goes up and down. It has a tension and then it disappears. And you said it's very inconsistent. Um, I'm interested in whether there's now a consistency of attention in the relationship between the Biden White House and the Biden State Department, you know, over the importance uh, of relations with you and Rwanda, or whether it is something that goes to sleep for a while and then and then wakens when there's a crisis or a problem. What is your, you know, what's the terrain of that relationship? I think you can take my previous statement when you were in <laughs> in Washington. Uh, it. it it hasn't changed much. Mm. And uh, when I answered that question, 
I was also conscious that uh, things don't change so easily anyway in some cases and uh, with this one it wasn't going to change but um, and 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 for example say savagena should not have been a case to quarrel about between the united states mm. and Rwanda anyway to begin right. with right but and we did we dealt with it because it was there to be dealt with and we tried to do it the best way we could we got it out of the way and but uh, even even getting beyond that you're not right. having you know nirvana in us rwanda relations is no, what i'm hearing no 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 no, no nirvana let yeah, me just yeah. ask you really oh, go yeah, ahead you go, are, go ahead you are talking, going to sleep and waking up this time they hasn't been waking up it has been <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's going to be tweeted somewhere. And look, the, the other controversial thing uh, you and I have discussed before is the um, UK's Illegal Migration Act. You know, Rwanda hosts and brings into Rwanda as part of a relationship with the UK. Asylum seekers come in and Rwanda has been designated as a safe uh, place and harbor by UK courts. And, you know, that's controversial with a lot of people. It's controversial in some, you know, with a judge in Northern Ireland, et cetera. You and I have talked about um, the the environment, the jobs, et cetera, that you're trying to do for these employees. What's interesting to me is that a poll inside the EU has recently said that more than half of EU member states want the same deal with Rwanda, would mm -hmm. like to have that kind of relationship. And, you know, it's a complicated subject because asylum and dealing with people that are uh, 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 running away from whatever trauma or circumstance in their life there. But I'd love to get your thoughts on that. And the fact is that despite the controversy that some attach to this, um, to this practice of, of moving folks to Rwanda, which I imagine is both economic development, but it's something you're thinking about with regards to population growth. But the fact that a lot of other nations in the EU want it, what are your thoughts about that? Do you want to expand the program? Yeah. Um Putting the controversy aside, we, we in Rwanda, we insist on trying to do things the best way we can. And uh, there will be people who criticize, there are others who will appreciate what it mm. is for, for, for the fact of it. So we chose to be consistent in our way of trying to do things. One, mm. the fact that uh, there have been debates about whether Rwanda is safe, or the other, the other, then, but in the end, it is what it is. You mm -hmm. know it, Steve. UK knows it, Europe knows it, US knows it. Rwanda is actually safe. So being safe does not depend on whether somebody likes us or not. It is mm -hmm. a, a good we have provided to ourselves and to our country, and it exists. So let's put it aside. The other thing, what is lacking is the level of development that takes care of our people the way we want or that will take care of other people who come here, whether they are migrants or whatever, and wherever they come from, uh, to also be taken care of the way they want or we want. Mm -hmm. That's another thing on the side. So. The issue of uh, migration and how we dealt with it started way beyond UK. In fact, even now, today, we are handling, we are processing uh, migrants who were stuck in Libya, who are trying to cross uh, into Europe and got stuck there, or others were dying in the Mediterranean. Mm. And we started, we, we provided that safe haven for people to come here or be processed through here to wherever they wanted to go in 2018. Mm. It's not a recent thing. And that time, we had no agreement with anyone, so there wasn't even anyone going to pay for it except ourselves. Mm. The people worked for are uh, these uh, migration institutions, international institutions, or UNHCR, and so on and so forth. So since 2018, hundreds of thousands of people have been brought by air from Libya to Rwanda. 
This is what UK, I think, noticed that there was another way of dealing with this problem, which had turned into a huge problem for them as right. it is for the whole of Europe. Right. So they asked us if that could be expanded to deal with such a problem as they have. It. And we accepted because we have had a good relationship mm. before with the right. UK. In terms of our development, they have been supporting our development for many years and so on and so forth. So our people discussed, but then we had to discuss it. What, how do we do it the best way so that we don't cause any injury to anybody in the process, but mm. solve the problem for United right. States, uh, for UK, for migrants, and for right. ourselves. So UK provided because we told them, for example, that we can't keep, bring, we, we cannot bring people here because of our limited means. We're not going to be able to look after them effectively as you've been looking after them in your own country, right. except now for relocation. So that's how this development component on this part of the agreement came right. about. But anyway, support for our development was going on even before. Right. So now we are looking at, so the debates that are going on in the UK or in Europe or wherever about whether Rwanda is safe, for us, it is immaterial. We mm. understand who we are, we know what we have here, we know we can provide the security to anyone, governance and so. Yeah. What we lack is different. It is the means to apply to it for development of these people. So when people are there debating, is Rwanda safe? Is it that? Well, that becomes yeah. politics. Well, and, a lot, it's very popular with a lot of other EU states. Yeah. Look, I'm getting the uh, the signal that we need to bring this to the conclusion. I can talk, as you know, for hours with you um, on these issues and really grateful for your time. I want to talk about sports and what yes. you've done with sports is economic development and your sports diplomacy in Guinea and Senegal. There are a lot of things that we've got to leave for the next um, discussion we have, but I really want to thank you uh, for joining the Global Security Forum. Uh, I'm excited to see the airport in 2027, and I want to go to a future guerrilla naming ceremony, and I'll leave the, uh, to the audience to figure all that out. But uh, Paul Kagame, thank you so much. Great to be with you again. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Hope to see you next time. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, President Paul, Paul Kagame of Rwanda. I want to introduce Jean Paul uh, Niru Batama, uh, who is stand up, Jean Paul. This is the President's uh, uh, Special Advisor, Deputy Head of Intelligence, and I think you can now relax. So I want to thank you, Jean Paul. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. And uh, this is, I just want to say, it's a real pleasure to interview the President. I did this a few years ago live. And they told me, uh, the president's team told me when we did do a live interview, he was still in Kigali, but we were here. He says, when the president wants to stop talking or end the conference with you, as he often does, particularly with Western journalists, his face will scrunch up and his answers will get really, really short. And I've learned that in our discussions, that never happens. He could literally go on for hours with us. And so he does send his regards to everybody. Thank you very much.